Good morning. Wonderful to see you today. Anybody glad to be here today? Anybody been blessed by God here recently? Raise your hand. Amen. Anybody want to share any blessings this morning? We haven't done that in a while. Anybody want to share a blessing? Yeah, Mike. Amen. He does. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else feel like they've been blessed by God this week? Want to share? Anybody else? Yeah. Go ahead, Joel. My son Cody is home safe in America. So Cody's home safe. Awesome. Very good. Anybody else want to share a blessing? Anybody else? Yeah. Awesome, Michelle, yeah. Finished her last college assignment. Amazing. Be graduating soon. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Well, now it's on, on the internet, so there we go. <laughs> awesome, very good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father God, we're so grateful for the ways that you bless us in our lives, the things that you bring into our lives, and the way you provide and you answer prayer. And we're just so grateful this morning. We're so uh, thankful to be able to meet together this morning and be here. And uh, we're just overwhelmed with your goodness today. And so just be with us throughout this service. Help us see what you're saying to us in your word. All these things we pray in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. All right, so on the heels of Resurrection Sunday, that's what we were talking about all month, the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. Anybody believe that this morning? Right. And so we've been looking at the implications of that, right? What were the implications of the resurrection? And we've been looking at that for several weeks. We looked at the fact, we looked at the fact of the, of the resurrection. We looked at, it's not working back there, guys. All right. There we go. We looked at the fact of the resurrection. We looked at the witness, the witnesses to the resurrection. We looked at how the message of the resurrection spread out from Jerusalem, out to the rest of the world, about how the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what gives new life, and new life to who? To anyone who wants it, right? The resurrection of Jesus gives new life to anyone who wants it. And so along with these points, what we did all month is we looked at the people. We looked at the, the people that we read about in the scriptures. And we saw, first of all, they saw Jesus risen. Secondly, we saw how they were scattered. Thirdly, we saw that those people turned the world upside down for Jesus. Today, we're going to look at their example, and I want us to see how they were compelled. Everybody say compelled. You ready? Compelled. One more time with gusto. You ready? Compelled. Well, what does that word mean? What does it mean to be compelled by something? Compelled is a verb that means to force or to drive something. To do something often out of necessity or duty or pressure. It implies a sense of being pushed or obligated to a particular action. So these people we read about in the New Testament were compelled. Buy something to do something. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 24. He says, For Christ's love compels us. Say that with me today. For Christ's 
love compels us. What does that mean? It means what Jesus did for us. When Paul writes this, here's what he means. What Jesus did for us is something that drives his entire life. The love of Jesus is something that makes him do what he does. The love of Jesus, it's the reason, it's the motive, it's the one thing that causes every action in his life. He says, for Christ's love compels us. Say it, for Christ's love compels us. And Paul says it doesn't just compel me. He says it compels us. It compels all of those other people that we read about in the scripture, all of those people that joined him in the endeavor to share the love of Jesus. Christ's love compelled Barnabas and Silas and Timothy, and Titus, and Luke, and John Mark, and Aquila, and Priscilla, and Apollos, and the list goes on and on. Christ's love compels us. All of the kingdom workers we read about in the pages of the New Testament, they're compelled. They're compelled by the love of Christ to do the things that they did. Why were they so compelled? For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. You see, the compulsion came from a what? The compulsion came from a conviction. They believed this. They were convinced that these things were true. And that for them translated into action. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. We've been talking about the resurrection And I don't know if you've noticed, but what did we actually title this series? We titled the series, All In. And the subtitle is, Say Yes to the Mission of the Church. The examples we've seen in each message have been people who were compelled by the conviction. For some of them, it took a lot of different things, right? For some of them, it took seeing the risen Jesus. For some of them, it took persecution. For others, it took God very bluntly telling them what he wanted for them. But no matter what it was from that point forward, from the point of conviction forward, these people could not help themselves. And it didn't matter the hardship. It didn't matter the cost. It didn't matter what they were threatened by. They were compelled by the love of Jesus. So today, here's something I want us to realize about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus died so that you could be forgiven. Yes, he did so so that you could come back to God. But the resurrection of Jesus is not just an act of redemption. The resurrection of Jesus is a call to action. The resurrection is not just an act of redemption. It is also a call to action. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, listen to this, 
that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What do those verses say? Brothers and sisters, if you have accepted what Jesus has done for you, that decision is not a little trophy that you put on your shelf. That decision is not a rite of passage that everyone does at a certain age. I would say that decision is not just a reservation for an event for a future date. That decision is not a ticket that you hold on to for entrance into glory. When Jesus died and rose again, he bought you. Anybody realize that today? He bought you. And when we have accepted that, we are purchased out of slavery. And we do not belong to ourselves. We, do, we no longer belong to this world. We belong to him. And like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. So Jesus is not something you simply add to your life. Jesus is something that's supposed to change your life. You belong to him, and his love is supposed to be compelling us to action. In this section, he goes on to tell us some things that Jesus' love changes. First of all, what it changes is it changes how we see other people. Because he goes on and he says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Why do we no longer view anyone from a worldly point of view? Because who does Jesus want? Who does he want? He wants everybody. Right? He wants everyone. And it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your race or your color. It doesn't matter. Because each and every one of us, who are we? We are a, a person who is created to be an image bearer of God. And yes, that has been messed up. Yes, that has been tainted in all of us, but Jesus came to restore that within all of us. So we need to stop seeing people from a worldly point of view. We need to stop attributing value or even the lack of value based on our own predetermined standards. God calls us to look beyond all of those things and see that human being, that thing of immense worth to God. And so that person you judge, that person you dislike, that person you avoid, that person you think is worthless, who are they to God? They are something of immense value. They are the crowning jewel of God's creation. And there's nothing more valuable to God than that person. So we need to begin to see people the way that God sees them. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, he says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. When people come to Jesus, all of that old life is gone and they are new and it changes how we see other people, and it changes how we see ourselves. He says, all of this is from God, who reconciles us 
to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, listen to this, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. Man, you might think, man, I'm nobody. You might go, well, Jim, who am I, right? I, I, don't, I don't know a lot about the Bible. I, I'm not someone who can teach a class or preach a sermon or give a meditation. We don't think of ourselves the way that God thinks of us. And here, Paul says, you do have a message. Christian, you have a message. And you have a ministry. You have something to say. You have something to do. He says, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is an official representative, right? An ambassador can communicate on behalf of the one that sent them. The, the, the ambassador is the face, right, of the organization or the, or the person. And it's like this past week, I was in aggressive negotiations with my former cell provider. Right? Anybody ever been there? And I was on the phone with the corporate customer service representative. And they were telling me things and they were promising me things. And I went to the, the corporate store and the local manager was refusing to make good on what corporate said, right? And I had to remind the manager, I had to remind the, the guy at the counter that the, he's not a third-party reseller, right? He's not a franchise. This is a corporate store. So when corporate says something, who is he? I said, you're corporate, <laughs> right? He's the ambassador. And Christian, you are official. You are the ambassador. You've been sent with a message and a mission. You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus to the rest of the world. And so that changes how we see other people. That changes how we see ourselves. And it should change how we live our lives. He goes on to say, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of of God. Jesus made it so that we could be reconciled, we can be in right relationship with God. Whatever hostility was there, Jesus removed. Whatever wrong had been done, Jesus made it so that we can be forgiven. Jesus took our sin so that we could be righteous, right? And so in that relationship that's now been fixed, how are we supposed to move forward? We're supposed to be living our lives to please Him, right? We're supposed to be living every day of our life to please Him. John says in 1 John 1, 5 through 9, this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. Man, you read these verses, and one of the things we got to do is we got to admit that we have sinned. Everybody admit that? So we admit that we've sinned, but then there is this call to walk in the light of God's truth. To walk in the light of God's truth and his righteousness. And what is walking in the light? Walking in the light is living your life, being transparent and being honest before God. Just like light exposes darkness, walking in the light requires us to bring our sins and our struggles to him. Confess our sins. And God is faithful and just, it says. When we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We even find in those verses that it is that, it is walking in the light, that actually enables us to have real, genuine fellowship with each other. Did you see that there? Because what are we doing? We're coming together and we're sharing this common goal and this common pursuit and this common way of life. It changes things. It changes how we see other people. It changes how we see ourselves. It changes how we live our lives. It even goes on to say it, it changes how we use our time. He writes, as God's co-workers. Man, do you see what he just called us? We're not only ambassadors, what are we? Co-workers. As God's co-workers. We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. As a co-worker of God, we're called not just to receive the grace of God. As a co-worker of God, we're called not just to receive the grace of God, but to actively participate in spreading the message of salvation to everyone around us. It says, don't receive God's grace in vain. And that means there is an appropriate response to receiving it. The response to receiving it is then we turn around and we share it. We need to let the grace of God transform our lives and empower us to live as witnesses, as ambassadors, as co-workers with God. Brothers and sisters, we are called to embody the message of salvation in our words, in our actions, because in those things we demonstrate the reality of this grace that we talk about, of this love that we talk about, of this forgiveness that we talk about. And what did he do there? He just quoted from Isaiah 49, 8 to emphasize the urgency of the moment. He quotes those verses and Paul writes, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. What is he saying? He says, we need to take action and we need to do it when? The time to share the gospel is now. The time to receive the gospel is now. Ephesians 5, 13 through 16, everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it's said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. As ambassadors, we have been entrusted with this precious message of salvation and we have a responsibility to share it with other people. That means we need to be intentional about sharing our faith with those around us, whether through conversations, acts of kindness, invitations to church. It means living lives that reflect the love and the grace of Jesus, drawing others to him through that witness. We need to embrace our role. 
if we believe in the resurrection, if we've accepted the good news of Jesus, we need to embrace our role as ambassadors and co-workers with God. Reconciling the world back to Him. Let's not receive God's grace in vain, but instead allow it to empower us to share this life-transforming message of salvation. Will you do that today? If you're here and you have not received the grace that God is offering to us, will you do that today? Now is the day of salvation. And if you're here and if you're here and you've already received it, realize who you are now. You are an ambassador. You are a co-worker with God. Embrace that. We're going to go ahead and sing a song of decision this morning. If you want to make a decision for the Lord, you come forward this morning as we all stand up together and as we sing. people. This is Tim Fitzgerald. And this is Aiden Palmer. They come forward this morning. They're already immersed believers, but they've decided this is where they want their church home to be. They want to be serving with us and sharing with us. And so they come forward this morning to put in their membership. I'll just ask both of you, do, believe, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son? Yes, sir. Repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is Christ the, son of God, the son of God, and he's my Lord, he's my Lord and my Savior. And Let's welcome them this morning with applause. <laughs> And everybody, this is, uh, this is Zach Dunn. He comes forward this morning, and he wants to be baptized today. And so, uh, Zach, I ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son? I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. All right. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The son of God. The son of God. And I take him as my Lord. And I take him as my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. All right. Awesome. Everybody welcome Zach. We're going to go over across the... We're going to go over into the other building here in a few minutes, and we'd love for you to join us over there to witness Zach's baptism today.